Why is it doing this? I don't know. Oh, oh we're live. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, welcome to Earth Live. My name is Erin Rainey. I'm a wildlife camerawoman, so I travel all around the world and film wildlife. Um, one of the things that got me into wildlife was actually growing up in a really science-based family. So my parents were always having us, you know, dissect salmon or pick up roadkill, permitted of course. And so I thought a really cool way to do this Earth Live session would to be to have my mom with me. So this is my mom, Candy. Hi everybody, my name's Candy Rainey. I am a teacher librarian in Shelton, Washington at Mountain View Elementary. And yeah, most of the skulls that we're gonna show you today are in my library, as well as stuff in jars and mounted animals. So when they say the library has stuffed animals, they're real stuffed animals. So what do you say, Erin? Um, I think we need to have a funny story. Yeah, so we're gonna start with a story, and I think we should do a skull-based story. All right. So I grew up in a family that's super into science, like I said, and I've kind of grown up and it seemed really normal. So I was out on a remote shoot. We were on this remote island in Alaska, away from anyone. We were probably, I think it's like 50 miles away from any other person. No one else is on this island. And I stumbled upon a dead brown bear. And it was a full carcass of a dead brown bear. And it had been frozen over the winter. So it was still decomposing. As you can imagine, it smelled horrible. I think that's the worst. Well, one of the worst <laughs> smells. We have a story about that. Yeah. Um, it was one of the worst smells. And so I took all these pictures of it. And I was, you know, scraping around in it and trying to figure out you know, what happened to this bear? So I took all these pictures and I got back into service about a month later and I hadn't talked to my mom mm -hmm. for over a month. So she didn't know what was going on, what I was doing. And the first thing she gets is about five, six pictures mm -hmm. of a dead bear. And look, mom, look what I found. And I was so stoked and I was so excited. And it wasn't until afterwards when I was telling someone about it that they're like, you, you do realize how weird that is, that you hadn't talked to your mom and the first thing she gets are five dead bear pictures. And they were a little morbid, maybe, but she was super excited. I she was really excited. Oh, she, absolutely. And it was so fun to try to figure out the mystery. And that's what it's all about. Yeah, we were trying to figure out how it died. And it, it was really cool because it was near this, this area that it shouldn't be and that we didn't expect it to be. So we had all these theories and hypotheses of why mm -hmm. and how this animal died. And that's the really cool thing you can you can become a scientist. You can become a, a detective. detective. Yeah. Um, when you find a skull, when you find scat. So that's kind of. I grew up loving skulls, loving you know different science things, and it's all thanks to this lady. Well, and, and my dad. And her dad. <laughs> yeah. So funny story. I have lots of funny stories because kids are curious. They're scientists, and they're always bringing me things. Um, always. One that, yeah. <laughs> always. So one that I remember very vividly is a child running up to me in the hall with this bag. And I'm standing around some other staff members and the child goes, Mrs. Rainey, I found some bones. And he opens up the bag and unfortunately, everything hadn't decomposed away from the bones. And the bag opened and the stench came out and the adults around me started to turn green. And I told him, shut the bag. And for the next week, we had lessons on leave the bones alone until all the meat's off it. Don't bring those into the school until they're totally clean, thanks. <laughs> so that's a pretty fun story. Yeah, so there's been lots of times that I've gone into my mom's library and kids are bringing her all sorts of things they're finding in their yards. Um, you had a beehive at one point that was brought in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> There's always lessons once these kids bring things in. And it's been really exciting because I think the thing we've both talked about is that kids are so curious and it's so fun to let them explore. Oh, yeah. And when they find something, trying to figure it out together. I mean, you don't have to have a degree You in, in biology or science. You just be curious with them and learn together. And that's the best part of science is being curious and being observant. And kids are naturally that way. You just have to kind of help them along with it. Yeah. And on, on that note, our science lesson today is actually on skull identification. So we have a vast collection of skulls. Um, we, uh, well, you obtained a roadkill permit when I was in middle school. Um, and this is for science. So we're able to collect roadkill. For education. For education. Mm -hmm. We're able to collect roadkill and 
um, we have to process it. So a lot of times the roadkill obviously still has meat on it. And it's been really interesting to learn how to process it. So when I was in middle school, we had freezers full of dead animals, which is really awkward when you're already an awkward person. And then your friend comes over and a beaver falls on them when they're trying to get a frozen burrito. So <laughs> Weird way to sorry, grow up, <laughs> but we did pick up a lot of roadkill growing up, and we found the best way, in our opinion, to clean a skull. First, we tried putting them in ant hills. Mm -hmm. We came home, and our friends came to dinner, and our dogs had heads of animals in the garden because they had dug them up. Mm -hmm. the, next, <laughs> the next way we tried was crab pots, so we put the skulls into a crab pot. Our, the idea is that the crabs will eat the meat off of it. You actually end up losing quite a few teeth that way. Mm -hmm. They don't stick in quite as well. Um, so our next uh, idea was biz. Um, so we put the skulls in a crock pot. You put biz in it, which is a laundry detergent. Mm -hmm. And it breaks down proteins like grease and, and stuff like that on your clothing. So it does really well on a bone. Yeah. So we... we um, we put it in the biz, and this was a bobcat, wasn't it? Yes. So we had a bobcat skull. They put it in the biz the night before. We woke up, and all of us have pretty strong stomachs from, from this type of thing. We were all about to throw up in the morning because the smell was so bad. And we put it outside, and even the dogs wouldn't go anywhere near it. It right. smelled for days. It smelled terrible. That smell lingered. So if you're ever going to crock pot and boil a skull, make sure you do it outside. You know what, though? It, that's all part of science, too, is figuring out what works, you know, exploring. Oh, we already have a question. What is the weirdest skull you found? Hmm. Weirdest skull. Well, the weirdest skull, I would say. That's a tricky one. That is a tricky one. Actually, I think the weirdest skull that was given to us. Let's talk about some because lots of people give us things. Once you get started in this, people are really excited to share what they have. Um, one that I thought was really kind of cool is this one, <gasps> what is that? It's a pelican skull. You can see it's actually hollow on the lower beak. So that's a pretty cool one. That's a pretty cool one. And then we've also found whale skulls along the coast of Alaska and those have been really cool and those also, you can smell it from a very long way away. And regulations are different in every area. We have a question about um, regulations. So in our area, we need a permit to pick up roadkill, or at least we used to. For education. For education. So make sure you look at the regulations and guidelines in the area you're in. We're in the United States. So we'll move on to the skulls now. All right. All right. We're going to give some examples of different types of skulls, and then we're going to have mystery skulls. And hopefully you guys all participate and join in, and you can guess. So we'll start with carnivores. All right. Carnivores. Um, one thing we need to note, though, is that you really need to take a look at the teeth and the orbits, the orbits are where the eyeballs fit. And those are gonna be great clues as to what that skull or what that animal is. So you wanna start with this one here? Carnival. Yeah, and so these skulls are from the area that we kind of are in. So we're looking at Washington State, of BC, and in Alaska. So keep that in mind when we do the mystery skulls, we're gonna kind of stick to that area. All right, so this first one, let's take a look. Light on it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that'll, that'll okay. not as highlighted. So, first thing you need to look at are the are the orbits, the eyes. And this one, well, we already said it was a carnivore. So if you take a look, you'll notice that the orbits, the eyes, are pointing forward. And there's a reason for that. Yeah, so the reason the eyes face forward is because it is a predator. So it's hunting other animals and it needs to have the binocular vision. Binocular vision. So it's looking straight ahead. It needs to have depth perception. So having those eyes face forward actually gives that depth perception. So they know how far away or how close they are to that prey that they're trying to hunt. So always take a look at the orbits. Are they facing forward? Next, you want to take a look at the teeth. This is fabulous. So we'll take a look at the lower jaw. Ooh, there, see if we can make it oh, look. There we okay. go. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Maybe hold it closer. Definitely. Hold it closer. Oh, there we go. So you've got incisors. These are the small teeth in the front. And yeah, for um, for carnivores, they usually just use those for grooming or nipping. The next ones, the canines, those are the teeth that they use to grasp their prey. So if you take a look at the top and bottom, they fit together beautifully. Those are their canines. Premolars and molars. On canines, they're usually used to shred um, or to um, crunch bone, depending on what kind of carnivore it is. So clues, canines that are really big, um, 
little incisors that don't have a lot to do, and then um, your shredding teeth in the back, okay? All and right. the other thing to look at is look at the snout. So that is actually an indication as well. So if you look at this skull, again, sorry, the light's a bit funky. Look how short it is, and there's a reason for this. Oh, yeah. So the shorter the snout, they've got these little bones on the inside, these little plates called turbinates, and that gives them more area for those sensory, those olfactory sensory cells, um, that sense of smell. Um, animals with big eyes, they obviously have a great sense of sight. This short snout means that this animal, a bobcat, doesn't really need that great sense of smell. So their sense of smell isn't that good. So on canines, you'll see that they actually have quite a long snout. Mm -hmm. Because their sense of smell is fantastic. And they're more dependent upon that sense. Right. And you'll notice that their orbits maybe aren't as large in, re um, in relation to their skull as a cat's. Yeah. All right. First this carnivore. is a carnivore. Next, we have an herbivore. All right. You can probably guess what this is. So this is a mule deer. Um, we unfortunately don't have the bottom jaw of this one, uh, but you notice there's a lack of incisors here. And that's because deer, along with other ungulates, have a lower jaw with incisors and a hard palate here and they'll snip off different vegetation that way. And you can notice that their teeth are very different. Their, their premolars and molars are really different. Those are used for grinding any kind of vegetation that they eat. And yeah. then let's take a look at the orbits. The orbits are on the side of the head. Mm -hmm. So they have monocular vision, and this allows them to see almost 180 degrees with each eye. So think about it pointing out that way. This is useful because then they can keep an eye out for predators because they are a prey species. The other thing is they have a diastema, which is this space right here. And for ungulates and a lot of ruminants, that means that they're able to store vegetation. They eat a lot really fast, and then they can go to a protected area and chew it, and they don't have to worry about predation. Animals like beavers have this to be able to carry sticks. So yeah, there is a question here. So question from Facebook. Do you keep all the skulls once they've been cleaned and just use them in education or do they end up in museums and universities? No, actually we're very lucky. We get to keep them for the kids at school because they get that firsthand look and firsthand knowledge of what those animals and those skulls look like. And you're principal's really cool and is really into letting you get into science. So the elementary kids at my mom's school actually have quite a bit of science. They have a mystery school of the week where they have to write their reasoning for what, what they think the school mm -hmm. is. They get to raise salmon and they do a salmon dissection. So having science in an elementary school like that is so special. So yeah, and the library is a perfect place because where do you go to research? Figure out what these things are. It's the library. It's been fun. Omnivore. Omnivore. Our omnivore is um, our omnivore's raccoon. Okay, here we go. Ooh, there is an omnivore. <laughs> oh my gosh! What is the deal with omnivores? They have teeth that are similar to both the herbivore and the carnivore. You see those little incisors in front. You see those canines that are pretty sharp. But the teeth in the back, those are more for grinding vegetation. They're kind of like the deer's teeth, if you remember that. So um, they are kind of a combination of both. Looking at the orbits, the orbits are facing forward. So that helps them with uh, as a predator. And the teeth kind of help them with both jobs, eating meat and eating plants. And we do have a picture. We do. Do you want to show a picture? Yeah. And while she's getting up the picture, we have a question. Have you seen an increase in the amount of roadkill in recent years? We haven't really seen in mm -hmm. our area an increase in roadkill. Um, the population in the area we live in has kind of stayed the same, kind mm -hmm. of the same amount of traffic. So that's not changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really haven't seen an increase. Um, that doesn't mean we always <laughs> don't have our eyes looking around for roadkill. Like, we <laughs> all have this thing, all my siblings, every time we see roadkill, we're like, oh, should we stop? Should we get it for mom? <laughs> and I have to like actually think about it and not do it. <laughs> yeah, so that skull that you just saw was from a raccoon. There we go. All right, shall we move on? All right, so now we're going to do a fun thing where we have a mystery skull, and if you're watching, Take a guess. We'd love for you to take a guess on yeah. what it is. Tell us whether you think it's a prey, 
or predator. Tell whether you think it's an omnivore, herbivore, carnivore. Let's just go over that quickly one more time. Yep. Carnivores eat meat, herbivores eat plants, and omnivores eat both. All right, here's our first one. This is our first one. Take a look at the size. Let me give you a good look at the orbits. And then the teeth. Maybe show them the surface of the teeth, the back teeth too. Okay. Oh yeah, I appreciate your guess. You're a little off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's take a look. All right, so here's our first skull. We can give you a hint. This one is from Alaska. All right, and you can see the tag is for Oh sure. yeah, so we, first of all, it is a carnivore. That's really great, Annette. That's great, and we already have someone who got it. It is a bear. It's actually a brown bear. Okay. And, oh, it's an omnivore. Yeah, sorry, Annette, it's an omnivore, <laughs> um, which is surprising for a lot of people. So brown bears eat actually quite a bit of sedge. They'll eat berries, um, along with eating whales, if they manage to get one that beaches. Seals, they have salmon, salmon, seals. So this is an omnivore. Right. Okay. So you, you take a look at those teeth. So you notice the, the grinding teeth in the back for for um, vegetation, and then you've got your canines that work to grasp their prey. And we got a question about how do you tell the difference between a brown and black bear. It's actually quite tricky to tell the difference. A lot of it's size, but then also some of the molars are good indicators based on their size. There's particular measurements, and you can look it up online, and there's one molar in particular that shows the size difference, tells you whether it's a black or brown bear. Good question. Good question. And that is what you just saw. All right. Brown next bear. Is the next is this one. this one. All right. This one is a little tricky. What is this guy? Look at those teeth now. Hmm. And where's where are his orbits? Oh my goodness. They're here. So they're kind of out to the side. And you can see that it's got that diastema right here, that break. But what is going on here? Hmm. Oh, we already have someone who guessed it. This is a beaver. You're right. You're right. You are absolutely right. Okay, cool thing about beavers is that diastema, well, first of all, you notice the color of their front teeth. And they are a rodent, and they're actually the largest rodent in North America. Here's your question. What is the largest rodent in the world? I'm not going to tell you. You got to go research. Go to the library. <laughs> but um, they have this orange enamel on the front of their teeth. And then in the back of their teeth, they don't have that. They have this white dentin. And it's really important because the enamel, all rodents have this red enamel, and it keeps their teeth really, really strong. And rodent teeth keep growing as they get older into adulthood. Not other animals don't really do that, but if they, if their teeth um, didn't wear down, they could just continue growing, and then they wouldn't be able to eat anymore. But it wears down, and the reason it has the enamel in the front and the dentin in the back is because it wears down like a chisel. And why does it wear down like a chisel? So that it can chew on sticks. And do you see how it carries that stick? right there in very comfortably in its mouth like that. It can close its lips around around the stick like that. And so for for like rabbits and hares, you'd actually have peg teeth mm -hmm. behind, which have a different use. So that's one way if you have a skull that's a rodent, you can kind of take a look or you have these really prominent front teeth is take a look at those front teeth and take a really good look to see are there peg teeth or are they like this? Yeah, and you know, I tell kids, you have a pet hamster at home, a guinea pig, those are rodents, take a look at their teeth too. And this is actually a beaver stick. We pulled it out of our pond. And you can see the gnaw marks on it. And so we actually have something else to show you. Oh, okay. um, when it was Christmas, we saw tracks going from the lake up into the highway. And we were really confused why we were there. Well, it turns out the beavers are very territorial and they'll kick the young males out. So this young male had traveled out of the lake onto the highway to look for a new, a new home. And so unfortunately, it got hit by a car. And we decided to get it stuffed to show kids, you know, what does a beaver actually look like? So this is a young male beaver. There he is. There's our guy right there. And he lives in my library up on the counter. And the kids said, do you see the chips? This, these are the way that they would um, 
gnaw on that wood. There's a beaver stick. So that is what a beaver looks like. So they're actually a lot larger than people think. And that's a small beaver. Again, that's a small male. And luckily it was cold out, so it preserved this animal really well. It didn't have a lot of injuries to it. You can actually see where it had gotten in fights if you look closely. So that was something really interesting. Beavers will get pushed out of an area. And unfortunately this one ended up on a highway. And Wait, should we do one more? Yeah, there is a picture. There is not a picture. <laughs> There's a picture of a beaver with a stick the in his mouth. The marine mammals, the orbits. Oh, yeah, yeah. Aquatic. Now, take a look at where his eyes are, too. His eyes and his nose and his ears are on the upper part of his skull. And there's a reason for that. And it's because it gets keeps them out of the water when he's swimming. If his eyes or his nose were a little bit lower in his skull, then that would be a problem. It might be underwater most of the time. So his skull is beautifully engineered for the job that it has to do. And we're gonna do one more skull, a quick round, because unfortunately we're almost out of time. Go ahead and ask any questions you have on the side. We'll try to get to those quickly. Um, this is our last, the quick stop this one, this one. This is our last skull, so. Take a look, oh, I'm not gonna show you the tag. <laughs> Take a look at this one, look at its teeth. Any guesses? Turn to the front. All right, any guesses on what this is? Remember, what did we say about that long snout? Great Ooh. sense of smell. So it has a great sense of smell. Mm, look at those look teeth. Look at these long teeth, the canines. Where are its orbits? Facing the front. So it's a predator. It's a predator. And it's rather dog-like, wouldn't you say, with that long snout, great sense of smell? Hmm. All right, should we tell them? Yes. This is a coyote. Oh, we had Mason get it. Good job, Mason. That's actually one of my mom's former students. Yes. So Mason, way to go. Way to Yay, be a Mason. Detective. That's awesome. So we had a couple questions. Um, what is your favorite skull? My favorite, so I, I'm partial to the bear. Um, that's I think that's my favorite. It's so big and it's so strong. And I just, yeah, I love the bear. I think my favorite one is the beaver, just because it's so different than any other skull that you, that you might see. Well, I mean, other than other rodents. Yeah. yeah, next one. What's your dream skull to add to your collection? We're really partial to Pacific Northwest animals. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It would be cool to get more marine mammals. Those take different permits though. So I think in our dreams, that would kind of be where we'd go. Mm -hmm. I think so, I and think so. The last one, Timothy, age eight, do you ever eat roadkill and what are your thoughts about eating it? So in Alaska, they have a lottery system to be able to get roadkill moose because a lot of times the moose do more damage to the car than they do than so the car does to the moose. So it's a really great food resource for people. And actually in Washington with the deer, it's the yep. same thing. If they're hit and you can harvest it quickly, you can pick it up quickly, you can use it. Um, some of the meat is damaged, of course, from um, the impact, but people have. Yeah, so as long as it's legal, I say, and the animal's in good condition, Mm -hmm. Make use of it. Make use of make it. Make use of it. Yeah. And what are the marks that give clues to cause of death? Um, you know, since we only have the skull, you may not necessarily see the cause of death on that unless it's been hunted. And then you might see a, see a, bullet, a hole bullet, bullet hole in the skull. But otherwise, you really don't know from the skull. When we had the full bear that I was talking about earlier that I found, we had different clues. We had broken ribs. We had a broken leg. So a lot of times you need a little bit more to figure out how it died. Yeah. Um, really quick, what can you share about aging an animal based on its skull? A lot of times people use the teeth mm -hmm. to age skulls. Um, that's a little more in depth. Unfortunately, we don't have time to get into that. Right. Where, how can we get in more into learning about skulls? There's great resources online. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, my Instagram is at E period R A N N E Y. And just shoot me a message, email me. I can give you resources. We're all about learning about schools. Um, yeah, and you know what? Be a scientist. Take your kids outside. I mean, it could be in your backyard, it could be on the sidewalk. Go out after it rains and watch the worms on the sidewalk. Figure out why are they there. Get always it. ask questions. Always ask questions and make observations. You can learn together. Yeah, and the amazing thing about being a scientist is you're always finding clues and you're putting 
together pieces of a puzzle. And it doesn't matter where you live. You don't have to live in the middle of the woods, out in the middle of, no. you know, of nowhere. There's animals all around. There's wildlife all around. And you can always make observations. You can always ask questions. So thank you so much for having us. Lizzie. Thank you so much for having us. This has this been amazing. Has been you great. are incredible for putting on this program. Make sure you look at the other ones that have already happened and tune in for the next ones coming up. So thank See you. Earth later. Live. Bye, Bye guys. Oh, and <laughs>